Please join me in welcoming Olivia Williams. Um, hi everyone, and thank you for heading into the city um, this evening. It's um, it's quite a big deal actually to help out of our pajamas and our UGG boots, and um, or not to head home early and to come into the city and to spend time with each other and to spend time with people from different sectors. Um, so I'm really grateful, um, yeah, for 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 you for you doing that this evening. This is our beautiful world that looks far more peaceful from this perspective. Um, looking at our beautiful country, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which uh, we gather today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I acknowledge the devastating impact of colonisation on our country and as we come together to think about our world's future, may we commit to finding nature-based solutions and always respect the knowledges held forever within the traditional custodianship of country. Right. So, kick off. However you understand your future risks, be it the World Economic Forum Global Risk Report, the Ernst & Young Report, the Deloitte, McKinsey or Accenture study, there is a common understanding that we live in a time of converging crises, a time when acute hazards appear to uncover, compound and intersect with chronic economic, social and environmental challenges. I've been reading these risk reports for over a decade now and never have so many environmental and social concerns appeared at the top of our global list. And while these crises appear quite disconnected on that list, the pandemic revealed that these underlying tensions and through lines for us to see the complex and interconnected relationships that are broken or breaking between health, supply chains, employment, inequity, the list goes on. And while this complex network of relationships has always existed, COVID put these interconnections front and centre on our TV and on our social media platforms. So what have we learned over this time? And have we had time to reflect and to think about how we will shape our future? And while the environment forms the majority of risk concerns for the medium to long term, society and people are what is of most concern today. And I'm probably going to add children to, to that. But our traditional short term thinking leads us unable to holistically understand the interconnections and systems in which these challenges exist. We can see this playing out in front of our eyes every day. So while governments are scrambling to meet behavioural health priorities, we are increasing antidepressant and anti-anxiety prescriptions, while mandating mental health and cultural training through online modules. We have another team scrambling to meet climate change demands, pledging net zero targets and exiting anything with the word coal in it with actually not understanding what that means. Um, or its effect on any of these red circles on this slide. It can be easy to think and work as we always have done and it's really hard to break our mental models. So I thought we might try something. Um, when I say the word colour, what's the first thing that comes into your head? So when I say the word colour, what's the first thing that comes into your head? So just pop up your hand if you thought of blue. Green, red, what else we got left? Rainbow. What was it, Ed? A rainbow. A rainbow, anything else? Everyone else green, red and blue? Okay, so I could do, I can ask this question if I've got 600 undergraduate students and I'll get exactly the same percentages. I could ask it if I'm teaching in Singapore, I'll get exactly the same responses. Um, what does it tell me? What does that tell me? People are the same wherever you go. We think the same. Our mental models are shaped the same, formed the same, same patterning, even though, um, you know, obviously we're raised with different families, different values, different religions, different cultures, and we all see the world through different lens. There's some underlying patterns 
um, that are really formed and it's really quite interesting because we have to ask ourselves, how do we break those patterns? You know, because all of a sudden in my class of 600, I'll get a rainbow or I'll get a tangerine or I'll get someone who says uh, a Picasso or a piece of art or I'll get someone who says a flower or um, and all of a sudden and it used to be a decade ago those students you know everyone would look at them and go why would you say tangerine you know whereas now we go I need the tangerine in my organization because the tangerine is thinking differently about the world um, so it's really quite interesting I urge you when you go into the workplace tomorrow to do it with your teams um, and that's hard to, yeah, to break, the, to break that patterning. But I think um, the pandemic has given us an opportunity to break those patterns, to reset, revise, and think differently about our purpose, a chance to sharpen our perspective on how we want to impact people, our planet, and our economy. This was the theme underlying the recent UN Leaders Summit, the fundamental question of what are your values and why are you here? What is your purpose and what is your organisation's purpose? A fundamental shift of conversation to build businesses that exist in a world we want to create. And this was one of my favourite quotes from uh, the summit this year, is that we have no choice but to leave our egos and politics outside the meeting as we have to work together and we have to work fast. All no-go areas are back on the table. And as exciting as this sounds, um, it's exciting but quite uncertain. And certainty has definitely disappeared of late. And while risks have always existed, our models don't provide certainty for those risks anymore. So, what is your compass and what frames do you use? What guides you in the workplace? What's your principles? What's, where's your rule book? Um, and one such framework can be found in Agenda 2030. So in 2015, 193 member states signed Agenda 2030, uh, a set of 17 quantitative and qualitative goals established to combat our economic, social, governance and environmental challenges. It provides a framework for shared action across all sectors and all countries comprising of 169 targets and over 230 odd indicators and each country is measured on their annual um, on an annual basis and the 2022 results have just been released and I thought you might like to have a look at Australia's dashboard so this if if it doesn't glitch on me this is Australia's 2022 results as I put different resources up, I've added the website for you, um, but I'm sure Meg will share the slides later so you can, you can grab it off that as well um, if you want to take these and use in the workplace. So this is our dashboard for this year. Um, the dashboard is coloured as green. It means you are on target to reach the, the, the goal by 2030. And then we go to yellow, amber and red means you're at critical levels for that goal and you are unlikely to meet it by 2030. 2030. Um, we don't have any green and we've got a lot of amber and we've got a lot of red and some of those you'll you'll know why you know you could just listen to the ABC News and you'll know why um, but I thought it might be interesting to go through them you know we're sitting at obviously climate action is red um, that one is you know, we really don't have any policy around or, or, or how to transition um, around that at the moment um, Energy is a really dark amber. We know we've got the highest energy prices somewhere, you know, in different parts of the world. Number 12 is our responsible consumption and production. So Australia has the highest domestic waste consumption of all OECD countries, um, which is huge. And interesting one, I thought you might be quite interested in number two, which is zero hunger. And this is an interesting one because we can think that we're not necessarily hungry in, in this country, we, we produce enough food to feed everyone. Um, we just don't have access necessarily. Not everyone has access to that food. Um, and we really don't have a good, fair and equitable food system in our country. Um, and we tend to think that um, relief banks or food banks are, um, are, are enough and, and they're not. You know, we have about over three million people on food relief. Um, we have extremely high obesity rates. 
Um, so I think what's interesting about that one is it really urges you to drill down into the goal and see what the targets are. You know, have a look at what's in there and what might be relevant to your organisation and what may not be and what possibilities that brings. I think a lot of times there's a bit of doom and gloom in these discussions when really every, every one of those red means, for me, means opportunity, means innovation, means if we were able to pivot our company um, or pivot our business and think differently about the way we do things, there's enormous opportunity here with these, with these red and amber goals. Um, and in thinking about that, I guess um, this slide shows, may show, um, the ASX 100 in Australia and New Zealand. And it, um, I brought up this board to show, well, who is actually you know, using, running with the Sustainable Development Goals? And this gives you, in our ASX 100, 70% of our ASX 100 report on the Sustainable Development Goals at the moment. That's as of 2021. And this kind of gives you a feel for where they're they're focusing, um, and they don't choose all 17 of them. They just choose the ones that they feel um, they can tell a good narrative around. But some of them also choose the ones that they're not doing well in and go, okay, what does that mean for us? You know, um, what's, the, what's the lowest one up there? Yeah, it's interesting, see? This one, no one really likes to, to talk about food. And I think that's really interesting because even if you look at our, our government, our council plans, you know, uh, food is hardly ever mentioned um, in, in any of our governmental plans. So it's an interesting one. But in all honesty, there's big companies, there's small companies, there's not-for-profits, there's voluntary organisations. Um, our businesses are far more advanced in the sustainable development space than our, than our government is currently at the moment. But when we venture into the sustainable development goals, it's a bit like Alice in Wonderland. We fall down this hole and um, sometimes we, we don't come up. This, this information is changing so rapidly and so quickly, especially in our country over the past three weeks. Um, there's lots and lots of discussions. And so I thought I might share with you just some of the key resources, the places that I go, um, <clears throat> and then you can take that back with you to, to your workplace. The first one that I wanted to share with you is the SDG Compass. Um, now, the Compass was designed by the Global Reporting Initiative, the UN Global Compact, and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, this is a great website. You can hop on here. Um, I've just, as, for, as an example, I've chosen SDG 5 uh, for gender equity, but it basically goes through not only the themes and the targets, but it gives you specific examples. <coughs> So, uh, sorry, those of you on that slide, on the left-hand side, you'll see that it's basically taking us through all the business actions and solutions as examples of how, how when I say business, sorry, I mean organisations, governments, academia, not-for-profit. So how organisations are meeting this particular goal or the targets under that goal. So you'll see this one, you know, they're talking about um, equal pay, remuneration, childcare, zero tolerance, towards violence at work and expanding our relationships with women-owned enterprises. Um, so you might l go in these goals and have a look and go, oh, well, we're not doing that, or oh, yes, we are doing that, or that's an interesting way to tell that narrative. The other reason I like this website, on the right-hand side, it comes up with the indicators that people are using to measure gender equality. And I think this is really important because in order to, you know, we need to measure to show our impact in these spaces. So under these goals, it's really, you know, look at these, and it links it, you to the Global Reporting Initiative, especially for our larger companies, the GRI is really important. So you can see what it's linking with. For our small to medium sized enterprises, it gives you certain principles um, that you can report on. Um, and so that's really quite nice. The other beautiful thing that it does is takes you through some of the key business tools that are being used in this space. So around gender equity, a lot of people are looking at the human rights benchmark, the gender equity principle self-assessment. So you might want to do a self-assessment on your organisation. It'll hit you to you know, the impact reporting and investment standards or the poverty footprint. So again, you may go, well, that just makes me feel a bit more like Alice because I'm going to fall down this hole, but it's a bit more of a guided hole, I feel, 
um, you know, and just take what you want from these. The next one that I go to a lot is the United Nations Global Compact. I don't know if anyone from the corporate sector is a member of the UNGC for your organisation. You may not, may not. It'd be worth looking up to see if you are. Um, the UNGC is a special initiative of the UN Secretary General and it's the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative. Um, and it basically guides businesses to do business responsibly. This is an amazing network, um, and not just for corporates, for governments, academia, not-for-profits. You can sign up as a member of the UNGC. It's a great network. Um, their papers on here are amazing. Their networking sessions are amazing. Um, they're just a really good network to be, to be a part of, especially as this conversation is, is constantly changing. Um, so I'd, yeah, see if your, your company are, are, are a, a, a member of them. And then I thought we would be amiss uh, not to discuss climate um, this evening. And I think um, these are probably my three favourite websites at the moment in regards to climate and how to measure carbon neutrality or, or net zero. Um, now we know that unless we limit our, warming, our global warming to the Paris Agreement of under two degrees, the human species faces an uninhabitable planet. And I think what's really interesting when at the Leaders' Summit they use the word uninhabitable a lot. Um, and so we know we use the word uninsurable a lot these days and we know we're moving into an uninsurable world if we're not there already. But they're starting to use uninhabitable, um, which is, is quite confronting in a way, but I guess they're looking at it and going, we are on track to exceed the three degrees. So what does the world look like? And we know that to get there, all organisations must at least halve their emissions by 2030. So how do we help each other do that? Um, and so I think these resources are really important. So the first one is the science-based target initiative. And you may not be able to see that real well, very well, but I'll talk you through it. It drives ambitious climate action in the private sector by enabling organisations to set science-based emission reduction targets. It's a relationship between the Carbon Declaration Protocol, the United Nations Global Compact, World Resource Institute and the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Now since um, COP26 last year, the SBTI have 110 companies joining a month um, in Australia. That's a lot. Um, and so I imagine over the next three weeks that has grown over the last probably three weeks, that's grown quite a lot as well. So what the SB, the, sorry, I'll talk a bit more about them in a second, but I also want to show you this one. This one is Zero Together. This is really new, and this is a social enterprise that is helping not-for-profits achieve carbon neutrality. Um, and I think this is really important because to claim carbon neutrality or net zero, it's actually really expensive. Um, for organisations, it costs about $30,000 to receive your certification. Um, that's a lot. And then you've got your annual fees. Um, so we really need to help our not-for-profits, which make um, a huge array in, in our businesses. The other one is Climate Active, which is your government website, the Australian government website. You can be climate certified through the Australian government. It's not a bad, it's not a bad website. They tend to fob you out to different consultants. But the information on there is, is, is still quite up to date and really relevant. So maybe have a look and, and, and compare prices. But the SBTI, they also have a small to medium enterprise agreement. So um, to make it a bit easier. So for example here, this third one down here, which is Taylor's Wines, they set a near term target of 1.5. So when you set that target for the SBTI, that means you've set a baseline. Um, and they've ratified that baseline and you're now starting to measure your emission reductions from that baseline. What I did want to show you is, if you can see this right hand side here, these are our big players in Australia, these are our ASX um, guys, companies. Most of them have committed, um, but you'll notice there's no set targets there. Um, and so once you commit, to ratify, you've got 24 months to actually set your target and establish a baseline. I think this is a really important discussion because there are lots of empty promises out there at the moment in regards to carbon neutrality and net zero. And I think um, 
moving forward, it's it's something that yeah we really need to get our, our heads around and to help each other in, in this space. Um, this is just an example of your European countries. Um, all of them are green. Um, they are just so far ahead of us in this space, um, and they need to help us basically. I also wanted to refer to um, the Reconciliation Action Plan. I feel that the Reconciliation Plan is such a key tool and resources, a resource for organisations to use for sustainable development. Um, when we're talking about sustainable development, we are also talking about inclusion and equity. Um, and obviously our First Nations people are, are crucial in, the, in that discussion. And I wanted to put up this picture here because the UOW Reconciliate Action Plan has aligned itself with the Sustainable Development Goals. But I wanted to show you this picture because whilst it looks really confusing, the actual reconciliation plan principles are here and it shows how it aligns with the United Nations Declaration of Rights for in Indigenous Persons. It also shows how it aligns with the Close the Gap document. And then it shows how it aligns with the goals. And then over here, it's got how it aligns with the UOW strategic plans. And so what I think it shows you is how you can have an internal document and how it can really closely map with external frameworks. Um, a lot of the time in this space, you know, you're already, you, you, you've got your corporate social responsibility, you're already reporting a certain way and you think now they're going to throw the sustainable development goals at me, then they're going to throw the global reporting initiative at me. There's so many different frameworks that we're kind of working with. Um, I, I really like this image because it just shows you how everything can map quite beautifully together. And then if that all gets really too difficult and you leave going, oh, that's all so hard, it's just about starting with something and starting, you know, possibly starting quite small. You might want to have, a, you know, a carbon neutral work lunch. You might want to have a carbon neutral meeting, a carbon neutral day. You know, we've endeavoured here to have like a carbon neutral event. Um, and for us, you know, if I just show this, this image up here, so we used a carbon event calculator and the carbon event calculator looks at, um, we just estimated how many of you would drive. Um, obviously most of the emissions come from the, the travel to events um, and the food. Um, and then what we'll do is check that at the end and then we can offset those emissions to, to, to a, local, a local project. Um, but the current estimations is this event emits about one ton of carbon. Um, that's a lot of carbon, you know. Um, and what's really interesting about it is it takes one tree about 40 years to sequester one ton. Um, you know, that's a long time. Um, and in Australia, and I think you know, the whole offsetting discussion is really interesting as well. Um, you could spend hours talk, talking about that. But in Australia, you know, when you want to offset, it's about $25 um, per, per tonne. And I, so I think that's an interesting place you know, to also have a discussion at, at work. Um, if you want to look at offsetting your emissions, what, or what projects are you going to support? Um, now, obviously, when you uh, move to net zero, that you're not offsetting anymore. There is no, no carbon emissions. Um, but while you're getting there, um, what's your strategy around that? Which I think is some really exciting discussions. And then last, just to focus on partnerships. So our businesses and lives are interrelated, complex, connected, and definitely require a holistic approach and partnerships like we've never really thought of before. So I want you to think of your craziest partnership that you've had at work. Um, and then I want you to break that down and think again. Um, and it's more than brand partnerships, um, it's purpose partnerships. Um, you know, we need to collaborate to advance. There's no point if one company is using green packaging and the other one, and your competitor's not. We don't get anywhere. Um, it's, if I'm using green packaging, how do I help my, my friend down the road supplying the same goods also use green packaging? Um, Maybe they don't know where they're getting it from. Um, maybe it's all too hard for them. But I think we need to totally rethink what partnerships look like. Um, and so the idea for tonight was that at your tables to look at, and if one table's too small, you can join up with another one, is to look at, um, and the students can 
mix with the tables, is to look at the different sectors that people are from. And I want you to come up with the craziest partnership between those sectors. So I would love for you to leave here tonight with a possible project that you can all work on um, from the different sectors that you are. Um, you've got your goal for your table. You can focus it on that goal if you'd like. For example, what goal have you got? You've got life on land. Yeah, so maybe think, talk about what life on land means to each of you, what it means to your businesses, and then think about the different sectors you're from and how you could collaborate on something that could contribute um, to biodiversity in, in, in some way. Um, and it's really tricky. I think, you know, recently I was reading a story about McDonald's um, partnered with Hungry Jack's. And, you know, when McDonald runs its... Um, Big Mac Day and they raise money for the hospitals. Um, Hungry Jacks did not sell hamburgers that day. And if a customer came in and wanted a hamburger, Hungry Jacks said, you've got to go to McDonald's because they're raising money for the hospitals. Um, so that's really interesting. That wasn't in Australia, um, but it's really interesting. Um, and I think, you know, we need to think really differently about how we work with our competitors and not just our competitors, other, other sectors, you know, how can we, yeah, change the way that the world operates in order to ensure that we all kind of get there together. Um, this, I know we call it, the, you know, this race to 2030, um, but no one kind of wins. I think that's a really interesting analogy when we call it a race, we all kind of have to finish. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So. They're just my thoughts I wanted to share with you this evening. Thank you for listening. Um, let's see what we can come up with for 10 minutes and then we'll come back and close. All right, craziest partnerships. that you take away some nice relationships, that it's made you think a little bit differently possibly about something or that you have some tools and resources to take back to your workplace. Um, and it was, yeah, just a, a delight to spend some time with you. Just to let you know um, that uh, all monies received from this evening will go to, to, to Greenfleet. Um, they're an offset provider and they, they plant trees down the eastern coast of Australia. So um, yeah, which is lovely. So um, yeah, I urge you to go away and find the, um, because obviously if you think about offset, there needs to be a lot of transparency. It's quite a corrupt, it's beginning to be quite a corrupt industry. Um, it's like anyone can start up an offsetting project. Um, so yeah, you really want to look into it for, for, for your company and just, just be careful where, where, that, where that's going and how you tell that story. But lovely to meet you all. Please stay. Thank you for coming out.